All right, I am seeing a lot of people joining right now, so that tells me it's time to begin. Welcome once again uh, to this session, this edition of the ACT training webinar series. This, I believe, is our 11th um, episode, if you will. And today's topic is going to be all about integrating ACT with lots of different web apps that are out there. Uh, we're going to extend ACT by using Zapier. So uh, what I'd like to do is just start by giving you an, an agenda of what we're going to cover today. I'm going to give you an overview of ACT business app integrations, the different kinds of integrations that you can use uh, with ACT. I'm going to show you how to sign up for your Zapier account. And uh, then I'm going to give you a live demonstration of, wow, seven. I'm going to do seven connections. Okay. We got a lot to cover today. At the end, we're going to have a live Q&A. Well, we'll do live Q&A throughout the entire session, really. So if you have questions, uh, please uh, put them in the Q&A area of Zoom. That's the only place we're going to monitor. And we'll get these questions answered throughout the uh, session today. At the end of this uh, webinar, we're going to be sending you an email. That email will include a link to this recording. This is being recorded, and we'll send you a link to that, to whatever email address that you registered. And we'll also send you a survey so, let it, so that you can let us know how you think this session went. And also, if you have any ideas of uh, topics that you'd like us to cover in future months, then we'll, we'll consider those as well. Also, every one of these sessions has been recorded. If you go to the ACT website, uh, you can go into um, uh, that area and see the previous recordings. I'll, I'll show you where that is at the end of the session today. My name is Brent Milner. I've been part of this team, the training team for 17 years. Um, my role here at ACT is I create training videos. I teach employees how to use ACT, new customers, partners, pretty much anybody in North America. Uh, in my spare time, I, I live here in Flagstaff, Arizona, and I like to walk around the woods with my dogs. Oh, I only have two dogs. It says four, but we've, we've had some losses recently, so I'm down to two dogs. Um, today. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, ACT connections through Zapier. I'm going to show you how you can easily move your data between ACT and any of the business apps that you use every day. There's hundreds, there's actually thousands of connections available inside uh, Zapier. And this is all included within your subscription at no extra cost. So you can go to act.com slash connections if you want to view all the different connections that are available uh, between ACT and anything else out there. But I want to look at some of the available connections, and I'm just going to demonstrate a few of these today. So uh, the first one I want to talk about is connecting your ACT uh, database, your ACT account with your Google contacts. There's several different options for you here. You can create or update uh, contacts in ACT whenever you create new contacts in Google. And then conversely, you can add contacts to Google whenever you create or edit contacts and act. And you can even add those contacts into your groups in Google. It just depends on how you want to set up uh, the integration between ACT and uh, Google. So let me talk a little bit about uh, Zapier. I'm going to log into Zapier here. I've got a, uh, where is my, there it is. If you go to ACT and you log into ACT, um, a great place to begin is to click on the ACT Marketplace link in the left navigation. And this will show you some of our featured add-ons that you can purchase, um, but there are some connections that you can make uh, that are not, you don't have to pay anything for these. You can sign up for Zapier for free and set up connections and begin going today. Uh, what I'm gonna do is go to uh, the Zapier website. Zapier, see to remember, it rhymes with happier. Um, and I'm gonna sign up for a free account. So let's sign up real quick. Here you can choose to sign up with uh, your Google account, your Facebook account, your Microsoft account, or if you want, you can just give them uh, your email address. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to give them an email address that I created recently. Um, give them your first name, last name, and then click get started. Then you have to provide a password. That's pretty standard, right? Let's just put a password in here real quick and click get started for free. Didn't like my password. Let's do an extra character. Oh my goodness. How many characters do you want? 12 and 15 characters. 
not off to a great start. Let's go. Um, try that. Okay. I think it liked it this time. <laughs> I didn't like my uh, attempts at passwords. Okay. So once you put in a password, it's going to ask you um, to customize this a little bit. You know, what kind of role best describes you? How big is your company? You can answer these questions or you don't have to. You can skip some of these if you want. I guess these first questions are required. Then it's going to ask you, what apps do you currently use? And you can see there's a huge list of web apps that Zapier supports. This is only just a partial list. You can even search. It says there's over 5,000 apps available. So uh, if you choose uh, these apps, it just helps tailor that experience to you a little bit. Um, you can search. So for me, I'm going to say I like to use ACT. Type in ACT and then choose that uh, app and it'll add it to your list down below. So you can add as many as you want. I think uh, it, it suggests that you do five apps here. So uh, I'm going to do that. I'm going to click. I'm going to choose five. We'll do QuickBooks because that's what I'm showing today. Uh, QuickBooks Online. I'm also going to show Calendly. And I'll show uh, Dropbox. So you can't type today. And let's see, one more. Let's do uh, DocuSign. Once you have five, you can add more if you want, or you can click Finish Setup, or you can even skip to the end here. I'm going to click Finish Setup, and this will create my Zapier account. Now, this gives me a 14 day free trial to use all of the paid features uh, within Zapier. Um, but after that, I'm always going to have a free account for the basic features. Uh, so how does Zapier work? Well, it performs a procedure between two different web apps, and it uses a two-step process to do that. First, there's a trigger step, and then there's an action step. So think of it like a logical if-then statement. Uh, if this happens, then I want this to happen. And so to demonstrate this, I'm just going to close this tab and we're gonna look at our first um, connection. These are called zaps inside Zapier. So we're gonna create uh, a, a zap between ACT and um, uh, Google contacts. Um, but first, if you're going to use Zapier uh, with your desktop version of ACT, there's one thing you have to do first. You have to, uh, you have, to have a way for your database to talk to Zapier through the internet. And so on Act Premium Cloud accounts, this is already set up for you. But if you're on Act Premium Desktop, you need to install uh, the Act Connect link. And the way to do that is to go into your desktop, log in, click Act Marketplace in the left navigation. And then down at the bottom, there is a button that says Getting Started with Act Connect. When you click this button, it's going to take you to the Act website uh, on the Act Connect link page. Scroll down here and install the version that. Uh, most applies to you. Most of you are going to be on version 20 or later of ACT. So click this button to download the executable and then install that. It's a really quick installation. And once that installation is complete, you'll know it's working because when you go back to the ACT Marketplace screen, you'll see a URL at the top of the screen like this. This is the URL that you'll use uh, when you make a connection between ACT to Zapier to any other web application. Uh, so keep that in mind. But once you see this URL, you're ready to go. And so now we can make our first connection. And I'm going to connect to my Google Contacts um, first. So on the Act Marketplace, um, what you can do is click View All Connections. This will show you every connection that uh, we've kind of pre-selected for you. This is going to open up a, a web page on the Act website. And on this screen, it shows you a different uh, a way to get started. So what category do you want to use? Are you interested in connecting with sales and marketing or social media or your e-commerce website, any of those? Uh, click any of these areas to kind of get started on one of these uh, connections. Or you can scroll down and you can see kind of the best uses that we've, ha we've had uh, so far. And I'm going to connect to Google Contacts. So it kind of explains what's going to happen. And I'm going to click Get Started down below. What this will do is this will take me to uh, Zapier. Now, since I've, I've already created my account and logged in, it's taking me directly to this connection inside Zapier. 
And it says, all right, we're going to connect Act and Google Contacts. And here's, here's one suggestion. You know, you can uh, use a trigger to uh, initiate a connection and then choose an action. So what happens uh, with the trigger will create a process with the action. Uh, down below, we can see kind of the most popular ones that have been used before. So one of them is create act contacts. Whenever you, you know, either create a new Google contact or update a Google contact. Another one is to say, do it the reverse way, add new contacts uh, in Google uh, whenever we create new contacts and act. So either of these would work, or you can just start uh, on your own and decide for yourself what you want to do. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to choose, I'm going to expand this trigger area to say when this happens. Uh, what I want to do is choose a trigger. Uh, I want the trigger to be whenever a new contact is created in act. So I'm going to look for the ACT logo and choose New Contact. So whenever I create a new contact in ACT, what should I do in uh, Google Contacts? Uh, I'm going to create a contact. So I'll scroll down and look for the Google icon and then choose Create Contact. So here's my zap. When I create a new contact in ACT, I want to create a new contact in Google. And now I'll click the Connect My Apps button. This will now take me into the actual building of the zap itself. The user interface is, is pretty straightforward. Um, all you have to do is follow kind of the, the prompts that they give you. So for the first prompt, I'm just going to click this act area to expand this. We can see that in the app and event area, we've got a green check mark, which means we've already decided we're using act as a trigger and the event is going to be a new contact. So I'll click continue. And the next thing we need to do is connect to act. And this is where you need to sign in to your ACT database. If you're using ACT Premium Cloud or ACT uh, Premium Desktop, uh, your sign-in procedures will pretty much be the same. So I'm going to start with my username for my database and my password, and then my database name. And down at the bottom, it's asking for a URL. So if you're using ACT Premium Cloud, this will be the URL at the top of the screen. Um, if you're on Act Premium Desktop, this is where you go back to your marketplace and copy this URL at the top of the screen. Now you can click this link to do a quick copy to your clipboard. And then if we go back into Zapier, we can paste this uh, URL right here. Oops, paste. There we go and click yes, continue. And it will look at that information. It'll make this connection uh, between ACT uh, and Zapier. So let me go back here. And it's saying, uh, there we go. Now it's connected. You can tell it's connected because it says change here. And we've got a green check mark. All right, so now the next thing we need to do is test this. I'm going to click continue. And it'll take me to the test area. And it's going to say, well, we're going to test this trigger. We're going to look at a recent contact that you've created in your ACT database just to confirm this is set up correctly. Now, I created a contact uh, yesterday, so it's just going to look for one of the most recent contacts I've created. When I click a test, it does a search and it finds some contacts that I've created. And so I could either choose you know, which one I want, Sandy Robinson or Patty or Rose. I'm going to use Rose. This is the one I created yesterday. Uh, and so... I'm going to click continue with the selected record. So it's connected to my ACT database. It has found a contact. Uh, you can see all the fields here, uh, the name of the contact, ID status, uh, address information is in here, email, and so on. So I'm going to choose continue with this selected record. And now we can see that the ACT trigger is complete in Zapier. It knows how to find a new contact in ACT. And so now we move to our action where we're going to create this contact in Google. Uh, in the Google area. Again, we've already chosen Google, so we've got a check mark here, but now it needs to connect to my Google account. So I'm going to click sign in. And it's going to ask me for my Google account. And I've already provided my password earlier, so I'm, I'm logged in. So it has uh, completed that for me. But the last thing we need to do in Google for Google is to say, hey, uh, Google, I want to give you permission. I want to give Zapier permission to add uh, new contacts to my Google account. And so you have to click allow here to tell Google to give Zapier permission to make this connection. Once you do that, 
we get a green check mark here. So we've connected to the Google account that we want. I'm going to click continue. And so the last thing we need to do is um, configure this action. When we're creating a contact in Google, we have to set up the mapping correctly between ACT and Google so that uh, Zapier knows what information to write to which field. And so you need to go through as many of these fields as possible and map these between ACT and Google. So I'm clicking the first name field and in ACT, I'll choose first name. And then I'll do the same thing on the middle name. Even if there isn't a middle name for this uh, particular contact, it's still good to map the field in case you ever have a contact that has a middle name, it will copy that information over. So uh, you'll go through each of these fields and there's probably gonna be a lot of them and uh, map as many of these as you want. I'm not gonna spend all the time doing that here. I just wanna show you a few of these fields that I'm gonna map over. Um, additionally, there might be fields uh, that are in Google that are not in ACT, and you can choose to leave those blank, or you can just type in standard or static data, which would copy it over as well. Um, so I'm gonna map a few more things here. I wanna do my email address, and I wanna do my company name just to show that this is working correctly. So I'll scroll down and find. Also, if you can't find it, you can always search. If I type in COM, it's gonna help me find uh, the company name, I think. There it is, company. There we go. So that helps you find those fields a little bit quicker by using that little search. All right, I'm gonna leave the rest alone for now. And I'm gonna scroll down to the bottom here and click continue. Once I do that, it says, all right, we wanna, we wanna perform a test before we make this zap active. And so it says, all right, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna copy these fields into your, your Google contact. Um, and if you're ready for that, then click test action down below. So we should expect to see Rose Thornton appear as a new uh, contact in my in uh, Google. It says a contact was sent to Google contacts about seven seconds ago. So what I can do is log into my Google contacts area and I could search for Rose. And I could see there she is, Rose Thornton. Click her name, it's gonna show uh, the data that I've copied over there. So we know this is working. The last thing we need to do is go back to Zapier, scroll down to the bottom and click publish. Once we click publish, Zapier is going to uh, make this connection and make it live. It gives you a little congratulatory message here. Um, and there's a few things you can do here. It's good to name your Zap in the top left so that you know what this is. And I'm just gonna call it uh, new Google contacts from at contacts. You can name it whatever you want, but that's just good because when you go to your, your desktop in Zapier, you'll be able to see uh, each of the zaps that you have and how active they are. So I have one active zap running now and it says it's on. Um, uh, and I know that this is ready to go. Now, so what are the differences between uh, the free Zapier account and a paid Zapier account? Well, let's go and look at the pricing area. I'm going to go to uh, zapier.com. Uh, slash app, and I believe it's in the pricing page. So I'll type in pricing. And here you can sort of look to see what I can, what you can do with a free account versus uh, what it would cost to do additional, additional things here. Uh, some of the differences are um, some of the apps are, are premium, like PayPal, uh, Facebook lead ads, uh, QuickBooks Online. Uh, these are paid apps, and so you're either going to be have to pay Zapier to use these or your or these apps uh, cost money to have an account like Quick, QuickBooks account, you have to pay for that subscription. Also on a paid Zapier plan, you can create multi-steps app, multi-step apps. So in the app that I just created with Google, it was a one-step app. Uh, I, I created a, a, a contact in Google from a contact in Act, that's one step. And I'm gonna show you an example of a multi-step zap just so you can see the difference uh, also if you have a paid account you can manage more zaps so on a free account you can only have five zaps at any time 
Um, and then if you want more than that, you'll have to move up to a paid account. And also uh, there's a task limit per month. So every time that uh, uh, Zapier makes a connection between ACT and anywhere else, that's called one task. So by copying that contact from ACT into Google, that was one task. And there's a task limit. So I believe uh, with the free account, you get 100 tasks per month. And as you move up, you can get more of those. So if you're going to be very active, uh, you might consider moving to a paid plan. And the last thing I think is there's a 15 minute update time. So there is a little buffer of time, which means when I create a contact in ACT, it might take up to 15 minutes for that contact to appear in Google. They run these in batches. Uh, and as you go to higher plans, you'll see that that time gets reduced uh, to almost instantaneous. And so that's pretty much the difference. You can look at this page if you want, if you want to see, if you want to explore more of the differences between um, ACT, uh, between the, the free account and the paid account in Zapier. All right, and the next one I want to show you is a connection between ACT and Slack. Now, a lot of you use Slack. It's a, it's a communication tool uh, between you and your coworkers or friends or uh, really anybody. Uh, you go to Slack and you can create an account there and invite people to participate in uh, chat channels where you can collaborate and communicate there. So we can connect ACT to integrate with Slack in several different ways. For example, I could uh, trigger actions in ACT whenever I create new Slack channels or new messages or even uploading files in Slack. Um, conversely, I can post messages to Slack channels uh, whenever I create a new act contact or an opportunity. Uh, so that's one of the ones I want to show you now is uh, connecting uh, act to Slack. And the way I'm going to do this, so I'm going to go back to act and I'm going to look at my act marketplace. And uh, once again, I'm going to click this view all connections button. This will open up this tab again in my browser. And if I scroll down, we'll see that there is a Slack connection available to me. So um, this is our most popular. Uh, this is our most popular Zap. Uh, so I'm going to click Get Started here. And this will open up again Zapier, and it'll say how to connect ACT to Slack. Now, before I build it kind of uh, my own way here at the top, but down below, I'm just going to say, hey, this is your most popular one. Let's just click Try It. I want to see what happens when I just take the suggestion from Zapier. Here it says what we're going to do is we're going to, the trigger will be whenever I create a new contact in ACT, and the action will be let's send a channel message in Slack. So uh, I'm going to announce every time a new contact gets created in ACT. Um, you could change this if you want to say whenever a new opportunity is created in ACT, we'll announce it in a channel, but this is just a way to communicate things that are going on in the ACT database. If I click this trigger, we can see that the event has already been um, set up. It finds my ACT account because I've already made this connection once before, so I don't have to make this connection and ACT again. Uh, I'll click continue. And I'm just going to test the trigger once more. So you can see after you build your first zap, these uh, subsequent zaps after that uh, are a lot quicker to create. I'm going to test the trigger. It's going to look for a contact. Let's choose Rose again, Rose Thornton, since that's the most recent contact that I've created. And I'm going to click continue down below. So now we're all done. Uh, Zapier already knows what to do when I create a new contact and act. It knows how to find that information. So now we're going to connect to uh, Slack. I need to sign into my Slack account. And I, I've previously done this today just to save some time. I don't have to put in my Slack uh, email and password. But now again, Zapier requires permission um, to be able to write to my Slack channel. So uh, once we click allow, Slack will give Zapier permission to write to any of my account, uh, any of my account channels. If I click continue here, it takes me down to the action where now I can sort of tailor what I want it to do. So first let's pick a channel. Since I'm logged in to my Slack uh, account, it knows the channels that I've built there. So I have a few channels. I have the general channel that always comes with Slack. I've created an installations channel and there's a random channel. I'm just gonna use the, the general channel, I think. 
And then we have to sort of craft the message text. What do I want Slack to say to everybody whenever there's a new contact uh, created in ACT? So I've sort of just pre-written uh, a sentence, very, very plain, a new contact. And then I'll have the name of the contact put here. Uh, so I'm gonna select this, these X's and delete those. And then down below is where I'm gonna uh, insert some data. So how much information do I wanna provide in the channel? It doesn't have to be a lot. Really, I just wanna put the contacts first and last name. So I'm gonna search for uh, full name. And here it is, I'll choose the full name field in ACT. So it's gonna just paste that, that person's name in every time we create a contact in ACT it will post this to my general channel in Slack. Do I wanna send this as a bot? I'm gonna choose yes, because if I say no, it's gonna look like that message came from me. So I want this to be sent as a bot, uh, just to differentiate that from my messages that I might put in the channel. And then we can name uh, this bot, whatever we wanna name it. I might just name it Zapier Robot. You can call it whatever you want. If you wanna put an icon there, you can do that, or you can just uh, leave it uh, blank. If you want to include a link, what this will do is it will it'll include a link after every message to take you back to the Zap if you need to make any edits to it. Um, I don't want to make a link to that. I'm just going to put no here. And then there's a few other things that we could add to this message, but I'm just going to leave the rest blank and click continue. And so now I'm going to be able to test this, and it's telling me which fields it's going to use. Here's what the message will look like. A new contact, Rose Thornton, has been created from Zapier Robot. If I click Test Action, it's going to now make this connection inside my Zapier account, and it tells me a send channel message was sent to Slack about seven seconds ago. So if I go to my Slack account, which I've logged into previously, here's my general channel. And it says a new contact, Rose Thornton, has been created. And you can see some previous messages that were here when I was testing this out uh, yesterday and the day before. So there we go. Now, whenever I create a new contact in ACT, within 15 minutes of that contact being created, uh, the Zapier robot will announce that in uh, my general channel in Slack. Next up, I want to connect to uh, QuickBooks Online. A few things about QuickBooks Online. This is a premium app. So if you use QuickBooks Online, you pay a monthly uh, subscription or an annual subscription, whatever it's set up for you. Um, and uh, what we can do is a lot of different things here. There's a lot of different options for, um, for actions uh, and triggers. Um, you can create new act contacts, or notes, or opportunities whenever you create a new customer in QuickBooks. Um, you can trigger... Uh, additional act actions. Uh, so whenever you have a new expense or a new bill or invoice in QuickBooks, there's a lot of things you can do in ACT uh, to uh, announce that. Uh, you can create bills or even customers in QuickBooks whenever you create new ACT contacts or opportunities. And so I'm going to demonstrate one of these possibilities here. I want to show you um, how we can create, I think, a new ACT contact whenever we have a new customer appear in QuickBooks. So uh, what I'm gonna do is go back to ACT. And once again, if I just view all connections, um, I'm going to click this, view all connections. Again, I'll scroll down and you can see that there's uh, QuickBooks somewhere. Did I pass it already? Yeah, down at the bottom, QuickBooks Online. I'm going to click get started here. Again, this takes me into Zapier where it gives me uh, a way to begin. I can choose uh, the most popular Zap, which is what I want. I want to create act contacts whenever there's a new customer added to QuickBooks. So again, I'm going to click try it to let Zapier begin to build this for me. Uh, first thing I need to do is expand the QuickBooks area. And it's already chosen the app and event. So now I need to connect to my QuickBooks account. When I click that, Zapier opens up a little window here, just like uh, previously. And here it says, 
uh, do you want Zapier to access your QuickBook account? And I'm going to say, yes, I do. Now it's going to attempt to log into my QuickBooks online account. And since I was previously signed in today, I don't have to go through all the username and password stuff, but here it's connected. And so now I'm gonna to continue to test this trigger. Now this time it's, it's doing something a little differently. It's gonna look at my QuickBooks account to see if there is a recent new customer in QuickBooks. If I go to my QuickBooks account, we can see I have a couple of customers here that I've created, uh, really just two customers. I created one a few days ago and one yesterday. So these two names, Sasha, or John, they should appear in Zapier whenever I begin to test this trigger. So let's do that. I'll test this trigger. And there they are, there's two customers. I can choose between either um, John or Sasha. This is Sasha, so I'm gonna choose John because this is the one I did most recently. Just to verify, I'm gonna scroll down and make sure there's his name, John Fury and his company and all that data that I put in there. So I like that, it's successfully found my, my customer in QuickBooks. So I'm gonna click continue. And now we're gonna move down to the ACT area. In ACT, we wanna add a contact from this new customer in QuickBooks. So it already knows my ACT account since I've been doing this several times today. I can click continue. And again, now we just need to map from QuickBooks to ACT. So when I click on company, I just have to know what field we're using, company name. And I can click to the next field. So ID status field. There's no ID status field in QuickBooks. Um, it's just not, it's not a, a field that they use. So I could choose anything here. If I want, I could just type in customer. Since I know if they're already in QuickBooks, they're already customers of mine. I'm just going to type in customer as a, as a hard-coded field so that whenever I get an, a, a contact created from QuickBooks to act. I know they're already customers. So I filled this filled out um, for me. Same thing with referred by. If I know what they're going to be referred by, I could type in QuickBooks here. And that way I know everybody who comes from QuickBooks into act will have this little tag in the referred by field. And so now it's kind of smart. It's sort of figured out some of the names, some of the fields that it should map. It's done that for me. Uh, it's got my phone number, first name, last name, uh, email address. If there's a title field, I would put that here. I don't remember all the fields that I filled out in QuickBooks, but I think you get the idea. We could go through this and add uh, address information, website information, and so on. And again, I recommend mapping every possible field that you can. Um, even if there's no data in QuickBooks, you, sh you should still map it. Like, for example, the business address line two. Not every customer is going to have a suite number um, in their address but you need to map it anyway, just in case they do. So once all the mapping is done, we'll scroll to the very bottom. I have a lot of custom fields in my database. That's why this list is so long. And I'll click continue. Once I click continue, it looks up that contact in QuickBooks and it attempts to map those fields in ACT. If there's any empty fields, it lets you know, hey, you didn't map anything to any of these fields. Are you sure you wanna do it this way? And you can go back and, and change some of these if you want but I'm gonna click test action. And now what should happen is Zapier should create a contact uh, for John Fury in my ACT database based upon the information that was in QuickBooks. So it says a contact was sent to ACT about two seconds ago. If I go into my ACT uh, database and I'm gonna look up a contact whose last name is Fury. I'll click go. And there he is, John Fury. Here's his company and name. I think I mapped the phone number and the email and you can see customer and QuickBooks got mapped to those fields as well. So I should have mapped everything, but I just wanted to uh, get through this for the sake of the demonstration. So now we know that connection works, which means I can go back into Zapier and scroll down to the bottom and I can click publish. Uh, before I publish though, I might, might as well just name this Zap. We'll call it uh, QuickBooks customers to act contacts. Again, you can name it whatever you want. Uh, when I click publish, it'll create this zap. It'll turn it on so it'll be active or live. And once that's done, I can go back to my Zapier desktop and it'll show me um, this zap is, has been created. Notice in my Slack when I never named it, 
I could go back in here and edit the name of this um, zap as well. Turn that one on. All right, so we've looked at uh, Google Contacts. We've looked at Slack, QuickBooks. What about Calendly? A lot of you use Calendly. If you don't know what Calendly is, it's a great way for you to uh, allow your customers, your prospective customers, to just book time on your calendar. If you go to Calendly, you can set up uh, your own account. You can create different types of events that customers can uh, book time using uh, uh, of different durations. And then you can set up your availability within Calendly. Uh, so maybe you don't want your whole eight to five workday to be schedulable by customers. You can set up a smaller window when customers can then book time with you. And as they do that, that time gets booked on your Calendly account. You can uh, integrate that with um, uh, Microsoft Outlook, and you can integrate this with Act. Uh, but this is a one-way connection. You can't write from anything to your Calendly um, account. It's just in Zapier, there's no actions available inside Calendly. So it's meant for Calendly to be the trigger. Whenever somebody books time in Calendly, we're going to create an activity in Act so that we have that on our Act calendar. All right, so let's set this one up real quick. I'm going to go back into uh, my Act database. Actually, this time, instead of going into Act like previously and, and clicking in the Marketplace area, I'm going to create this one directly from Zapier itself. Just to show you, you don't always have to go to Act to create a Zap or a connection. You can do it directly from within Zapier too. So the way to do this is in Zapier on your dashboard, there's this the orange create zap button in the top left. So I'm just going to click create zap. And here now Zapier says, well, I don't know what you want. What, what's your trigger going to be? What's your action going to be? I don't even know which apps you want to use. So this is how you would really build it from a blank slate. Uh, for my trigger, I want Calendly to be the trigger. So I could start typing Calendly and then find it. When I choose Calendly, it says, okay, we know you want to use Calendly, but what is the event that should trigger this? And so in the event area, there's two possibilities from uh, Calendly uh, that you can choose. You can do it whenever uh, somebody cancels out on you or whenever somebody creates uh, an invite. And notice these are instant. These are one of the few zaps that don't require any, um, any uh, buffer time. As soon as this happens in Calendly, it will create the uh, action and act. So I'm going to create a trigger whenever somebody uh, uses my uh, Calendly calendar to invite themselves. And that's what that means, invitee create. It means they're booking time in Calendly. So I'll click continue. And now it needs to connect to my Calendly account. So I'm going to click sign in. And I have previously um, logged in again here. Now it says, allow Zapier to access your Calendly account, and it needs this API key. It says you can find your API key by navigating uh, to the Zapier integration page in Calendly. So fortunately, they gave us a cool link here, and it'll take me to my Calendly uh, API page where I could copy this API key here. So I'm just going to copy that to my clipboard, and then uh, going back to uh, Zapier, I'm going to paste that in here. I'm going to do this off screen, though, so I don't uh, have everybody um, uh, looking at this. So let me just real quickly pause my share, and I'll paste this in the box and click Yes, Continue to Calendly. All right, and then I will resume my share again. So once I've pasted that in, um, uh, I will be able to go back into uh, this zap where it's now connected. Uh, to Calendly. Now I'm going to click continue and we're going to test a trigger. So whenever somebody does an invite in my Calendly account, it's going to, that's going to be my trigger. So I'm going to test this. Now I believe in my Calendly account, if I look there, um, we can see that I've created several different types of invites or several different types of things that people can book. Uh, you can get a product demo which is a, an hour meeting, or you can do one-on-ones, uh, 30-minute one one-on-ones or follow-up, several different events. In Calendly, you can create lots of different events uh, that people can book time with you for. If you click scheduled events, it'll show you what people have booked time with you for. So uh, yesterday, I booked time for Jeremy Haas. He wants a product demo 
uh, on Friday, June 30th at 10 o'clock. So there's a time that has been booked, which means that uh, Zapier should be able to find this. And if I scroll down here inside Zapier, when it's doing this test, it says, yeah, this is a product demo. It's a 60 minute duration. And if I scroll down, it should show me uh, the person's name. There he is, Jeremy Haas and his email address and uh, the date and time is right here as well. So, okay, good. All that information came through correctly from Calendly into Zapier. So I'm gonna click continue. And so now I need to figure out what my action is gonna be. What, uh, what application do I want to create an action in? Uh, and since I used ACT as one of my most frequently used apps when I signed up, it puts those here in this sort of suggestion box for me. So I'm gonna choose ACT and um, it has already connected uh, with ACT previously, so it should connect this again. I just need to choose the event. What do I want to happen in ACT? And so there's a lot of different choices here. Create activity, create a contact, add a history record, add an opportunity, and so on. But what I want to do is create an activity in my ACT database uh, so that um, it ends up on my calendar. I'm going to click Continue. And so now that's ready to go. I get the green check mark, so I can click Continue again. And now it's gonna let me sort of fine tune this action. So what type of activity are we creating here? Is this gonna be a call or is it a meeting? Um, by default, I think all of these are gonna be phone calls. So I'm gonna choose this as a call type. And then in the regarding field, I need to enter something in here that just sort of reminds me, hey, this call is coming from, um, uh, from Calendly through Zapier. So, uh, I could put in uh, some kind of uh, description here on this field. I wonder if I did write up anything else. Um, I don't think so. I'm going to put regarding, and I'll put uh, regarding. I want from Calendly, and I'm going to say what this type, what this event type is going to be. It's a product demo for, for who is... Um, scheduling this with me. So these are going to be my fields that I look up inside Calendly. And so the first one is going to be the event type. I want this to be a product demo. So I want it to say in the regarding field from Calendly, a product demo for, and then I want the person's name who scheduled this with me. So I'm going to use invitee name, Jeremy Haas. So once I put those fields inside um, uh, this area, uh, it should it should work perfectly for me. Now, the next thing I want to do is um, find out who I'm scheduling this with. Now, I want to do several things, though. What if this person doesn't exist in my ACT database? Uh, how will it know uh, to schedule this activity with that contact in ACT? So for the first time ever, I'm going to create a multi-step zap. And what I want to do is I want it to look in my ACT database for this person, Jeremy Haas. If, if, if they find them in my database, great, schedule these, this activity with them. But what if they're not in my database? I want to search for them and add them as a contact. And so that's what I'm going to do here. Um, in my schedule with, I'm going to, instead of choosing uh, anything from this field, I'm going to click add a search step. And so now this is saying, all right, you want to add additional step inside Zapier. And the step that I want to add is to find or create a contact in ACT. That's the step I want to use. So I'm going to click add a search step. And we'll see now um, it adds a new step number two called find or create contact in ACT. Now I don't have to go back and set up anything. It already knows my uh, ACT account. But the action is going to be uh, to find this person. What field do I want to search by? Well, the most common field that I search by is going to be email. So I'm going to click the uh, custom area here. And um, I'm going to search by invitee email. Here it is. Since that's the data that's coming over from Calendly, that's what I want to search by. Oh, I'm sorry, I got that mistaken. Uh, in the search by field, I'm searching in act. So I don't want to I don't want to use the Calendly field. I want to use the Act field to search. So I need to scroll down here. And oops, I want to use a uh, custom field search by uh, email in Act. 
That part's just a little bit confusing. Uh, it knows I'm connected to ACT, so it's looking at my ACT fields, and it's saying, which field am I searching in your ACT database uh, to match data to? So I'm going to search by uh, the email field in ACT, and then the value I'm searching by, this is what's coming from Calendly. So in here is where I'm going to use the invitee email. Okay. Hope I didn't confuse everybody with that. Searching in ACT by email, the, the data we're searching by is from Calendly. And then we have a question here. It says, uh, should this step be considered a success if nothing is found? We can ignore this because what we want to do is create an ACT contact if it doesn't exist yet. And once I check this box, it removes that previous step and it says, okay, we're going to search the ACT database. If we don't find this email address, we're going to create a new ACT contact. And so then from here, we need to map the data uh, from uh, Calendly into ACT. Now, Calendly, we don't have a whole lot of data here uh, to map. There's not like company field. Uh, there's really very few fields, um, but we, we do want this act, uh, we want this contact to, to get created. And then later on, we can add uh, the fields that we need to add to it. So um, I'm going to only, there's only really two fields that I can use. Uh, one of them is uh, the name of the person. So I'm going to use uh, their first name. And I'm going to use uh, so invite your first name. It doesn't put their first name. I'm going to have to use their full name. And I'll put that in the first name field. And then later on, um, I can come back and uh, fix that. And then email address is the other field I want to create here. So when you're making connections like this, a lot of the times you're at the mercy of sort of the fields that are used in some of these web apps. So uh, because Calendly doesn't have a first name and a last name field, they just bundle everything into one field, um, we're going to have to um, map it this way. Um, in ACT, there is a full name field, but it's not showing up on my screen here. So uh, I'm just going to map to the first name, and then I will have to go back and fix that later. Now I'm going to click Continue. And we're going to be able to test this action. So it's showing, here's what we found from Calendly. Here's their name. Here's their email address um, right there. and uh, we're going to search for this person and create them if they don't already exist. So I'm going to test this action. So it's searching ACT now for that email address. And if it doesn't find it, it says a contact was sent to ACT about two seconds ago. I can go back into ACT here, and I can search for Haas to see if it's created that. And it has. I have several different people with Haas in their name, but here's Jeremy Haas, the one we just created. And we can see it even did write their name into the contact field. So everything worked out for me anyway. The salutation says Jeremy Haas. So I might want to go in there and just remove his last name from that salutation field to make sure everything is correct. Um, so that connection has been made. And Zapier has created a contact in ACT. So since that's worked, I'm going to scroll down here in Zapier and click continue. And so now the third step of this multi-step action is to now add this activity to this contact in ACT. And so we continue where we were from where we left off before, where we had um, created a call activity. The regarding field in this activity will say from Calendly, uh, I want to create a, a product demo, the event type for the contact. Uh, schedule with, um, I'm going to use uh, custom. Uh, scheduling type. And inside ACT, I'm going to schedule this with uh, the ID. So if I scroll down, uh, I want it to pull up the actual ID of the person that we're scheduling this with. And it'll always find that information because we've created the contact already in ACT. So rather than just putting someone's name in there, I want it to actually link to that contact. So I'm using ID here. Now, start time. This is not beautifully formatted in Calendly, but we can see that there is an event start time. And you can see sort of the way that's formatted, but don't worry when it gets to act, it'll, it'll make it pretty again. And the same thing with end time. I'm going to go into Calendly and look up event end time. There we go. 
And then if I want to enter any details here, like for example, I could just put in, uh, there's an activity request from Calendly. Uh, I could add additional information there if I want as well. Uh, location and priority, we can set those two as well. Okay, so now I'm gonna click continue. And I can test this action to make sure that this gets created in act. All right, so I'll go back to act and I'm gonna look at my task list. Okay, and we can see that there has been a activity created for me for the 30th of June at 10 a.m. for an hour. And it is an activity scheduled with a new contact, Jeremy Haas, and the details say from Calendly product demo for Jeremy Haas. So this has been added to my act calendar, which means uh, whenever somebody books time for me in my Calendly account, it will get added to my act calendar for me as well. Now, Calendly doesn't check my act calendar to see if time is already booked there. So when you create an app like this, you have to be careful to only give Calendly access to your daily calendar, uh, a part that is protected. Otherwise, Zapier can sort of double book you. Um, that's the only kind of caveat you have to keep track of here is um, make sure that that time that you allow Calendly uh, to have on your calendar doesn't get booked by anybody else. So I'm just going to call this one Calendly to act because uh, I'm not feeling very creative. And so now that Zap has been created and it gets added to uh, my uh, Zapier desktop. And you can see it's a multi-step Zap showing you every step along the way. And this is one of those uh, Zaps that is only available on a premium account. You can't do this on a free account. Uh, once that my trial ends, this will be disabled. Okay, there's a couple more that I want to choose, and I'm going to go a little bit quicker through these because we don't have a whole lot of time left. Uh, but let's say that you use Dropbox a lot. Uh, one of the, re in the reasons you might use Dropbox is if you're creating quotes or invoices and you're sharing those uh, within your organization, um, you might want to uh, make a note of that in Act that you uh, have a, a quote created or an invoice that's sent out. So there's a lot of things you can do. You can create activities. Um, notes and history records whenever you add any files or folders created inside Dropbox. Um, whenever you create a contact in ACT or an opportunity in ACT, you can create a Dropbox folder or you can even write to a text file. So if you have new opportunities in ACT, you can write to a text file in Dropbox that says, you know, so-and-so so -and -so activity or so-and-so opportunity was created in ACT. And that just helps you keep a running log inside Dropbox of all your new opportunities. So lots of different options available for you there uh, from Dropbox. Uh, the one I'm going to show you is I'm going to create a quote and add it to my company Dropbox. And then from there, I'm going to create, uh, I think, an activity and act that says, hey, follow up with this quote. Uh, so again, I'm going to create a zap inside Zapier. And uh, my trigger is going to be uh, Dropbox. Whenever I have a new file added to a specific folder in my Dropbox account, I want something to happen in Act. So my event is going to be new file in folder. And I'll click continue. Now I need to connect to Dropbox. So I'm going to click sign in. And I have pre-logged in so uh, we can bypass that step. There we go. The next thing I need to do is set up the trigger. So it wants to know what folder are we talking about in your Dropbox account? And so if you click that, um, if you click the um, field here, you can then look at the different folders that you have in your Dropbox account. So I have a quotes folder that I'm gonna use. And whenever I have any quotes that I drop into that folder, that will be my trigger. Now uh, there's another thing here that says include file content. So it, it will attempt to read the, um, the contents of that file, um, but my quotes are kind of, uh, there's a lot of uh, tables and things in there. So I think that's just gonna get confusing to look at. So I'm gonna say no uh, to look at the file contents and then I'll click continue. 
Now it's going to test the trigger. It's going to look inside my Dropbox account to find uh, any files that I've recently added there. And so there are a few. I added one yesterday. That probably is this one, file A. And if I scroll down, I can see it was a file called uh, Good Liquid. It's a grand opening for that for that company. And so I sent them a quote. It says quote here. And if I go into my Dropbox account, uh, I can see here's the file that it's talking about. So it has found that it has found that file for me. I'm going to scroll down. I'm going to click continue with this um, selected test. Now our action is going to be in act again. And the event I want to create an act is I want to create an activity. I want to create a, a, a to-do activity to sell to tell somebody, hey, uh, we got a new quote in here, follow up on it, just so that it shows up on somebody's calendar and it doesn't get, um, it doesn't slip through the cracks. So I'll click continue here. And now my action type is going to be a to-do action. And in the regarding field, uh, I'm just going to say follow up on uh, a specific quote. So I'm going to type that in here. Uh, follow up on quote file in Dropbox. And then I want to include the file name. So I'm going to, within these little single quotes, look for the file name here so that it pastes that name of the file inside the regarding field for this activity. That way, whoever this gets assigned to will know exactly what the name of the file is. Schedule with, you know what, uh, I'm going to schedule this with me. So I can either search for people in my database, or I can add a custom uh, field here from uh, Dropbox, but that doesn't make any sense because Dropbox doesn't know who I am. So instead, I'm going to schedule with me and I'll just search for my name. Oops, if I could type my name. There we go. It finds me. Schedule it with me. Okay. And then for start time and end times, uh, I'm going to use the date that this file was modified. That's kind of the closest thing I can come to um, being a, a good time to schedule this. It doesn't really matter to me what time it's scheduled. I just want it to appear as a to-do item on their calendar. Uh, and then even down here uh, in the details area, I can provide a direct link to the file in Dropbox. So I'm going to say uh, direct link to quote. And then down below, oops, I'm going to add a field uh, to the shared Dropbox link so that everybody can find that quote directly from within Act so you don't have to um, log into Dropbox and do all that stuff. Let's make this a high priority just so that we know it shows up in act and i'm going to set the privacy to false and now i'll click continue it says all right here's what we're going to do we're going to create this kind of activity i'll click test action and now it's sending an activity to act which it has finished doing so if i go back to act and on my task list screen if i just refresh this screen we can see now uh, there's a new uh, task that showed up that says uh, follow up for a quote in this file in Dropbox. You can see that it's a high priority. If I double click this, you can see the activity. And on the details page, there is uh, going to be a Dropbox link that I can copy into a browser page and then uh, view that quote uh, directly. Great. So this activity has been created. It's a to do activity, it shows up as a high priority item on my calendar. So I know whenever a new quote ends up in Dropbox, um, it shows up in Act 2, one less way for me to fail because it reminds me, hey, let's follow up on this quote, and see what we can do. So I published that. And now that one is also available inside, um, inside Zapier. Dropbox quotes, well, to Act activities. Save that there and then go back to my desktop to see now I've created a connection between uh, my Dropbox account and my ACT account. There's a couple more I want to show you. One is from Shopify and one is from DocuSign. I know we're kind of out of time. If you have to leave, don't worry. This is being recorded and we'll send this to you um, once, the, uh, once the webinar is finished. <laughs> Um, so Shopify is another example of a premium app. Uh, you can trigger 
uh, based on several different things. If people abandon their carts in Shopify, uh, if you have new customers or new orders, even when people pay, those are all kinds of things that can trigger. And Shopify is just one example of e-commerce sites that you can connect to. Some of you use uh, Etsy. Uh, there's a lot of different um, uh, storefronts that you can use to connect from uh, to act. You can also go the reverse way. Whenever we have a new contact or, or opportunity appear in ACT, we can create Shopify customers or, or, or orders. It just depends on how you want these connections to work. So for me, the most basic way to do this is to show when I have a new customer inside Shopify, I'm going to create a new contact in ACT. Uh, so again, in Zapier, I'm going to create this, this Zap. And I'm going to find Shopify. Uh, so you have to search for it. So let's type in shop. Here we go. This is a premium app. And uh, I want to choose an event of new customer. Whenever I have a new customer inside Shopify, uh, I want this to do something in Act. Now we got to sign in. And in Shopify, uh, you have to install a Zapier um, app inside Shopify. And once you do that, um, it will ask you to find your uh, Shopify storefront. So I think I have that here. If I go to my uh, Shopify, my storefront, I believe is this four, five, six digit um, area. I'm going to click home just to make sure I only just created this yesterday. So um, um, I think that is, yeah, I think that's my store. So let me go into Zapier and put in that, that little prefix. And it says, okay, yes, I'm, I found your store here. Um, I'm on a trial version. So it's, it's, uh, it needs, uh, to access customer information, possibly write things into there. So you have to install this Zapier app inside Shopify in order for this uh, connection to work. That's one of the strange ones that works a little bit differently. Um, but once you install that app inside your Shopify account for Zapier, uh, this connection should work. So let's go back to uh, my Zap. It has connected. Uh, let's click continue. And now we got to test the trigger. So it's going to look for a new customer, and uh, then it's going to be able to write that stuff to ACT. And I created a customer earlier called Robert Pleasant. So let's see if that shows up. There he is, Robert at Lake Pleasant Brewing, and it shows his name and some other information that I saved there. So we're going to continue with this, and now we'll just connect this to ACT in the same way that we've done before. Now, one of the things we can do here is just say find or create contact. So I don't want to create multiple contacts in ACT. I don't want duplicate entries. So this find or create contact event is useful because it will search first and then, um, and then add that contact if it doesn't find it. So I'm going to click continue. And then down below, we've kind of done this before. The field to search by is going to be email inside ACT because that's kind of my most unique field. And then the value to search by will be the email that was provided by Shopify. And then should this step be considered a, su a success if nothing is found? And the answer is uh, no, because we want to um, create a contact if it doesn't exist yet. And so once it does that, it's going to let me map my data between uh, Shopify and um, Act so I could go through and find all the available fields here. Uh, company uh, is going to be the name, uh, default address company. I think it's this one, and you just have to figure out what these fields are going to be. So uh, I'm only going to map three different fields because I just want to get this name to come across. So first name Robert, and last name is going to be the last name. May as well do their email address too, just so we have that on file here, because we have to be able to search and write. Okay, so I've got three or four fields that I'm mapping. I should really do a whole bunch more, but in the sake of time, I'm not going to do that. 
I'm going to click continue. And it's going to search my ACT database for this email address. If it doesn't find it, it's going to write that as a new contact in ACT. We let this run and it searched, didn't find it. So a contact was sent to ACT two seconds ago. Once again, um, we can verify this by typing Robert. It'll look up all the people named Robert here. And I can see here's one for Robert Pleasant, a new uh, contact that was just created. Great. So that one, that one works. That connection works. So I'm going to publish this. I can click this publish button right here if I don't want to scroll down. And it creates this connection now between Shopify and Act. Now, we could also create a Zap on our storefront if I wanted to create a contact record and then write a note to that Act contract record whenever an item is purchased. So that's another cool use uh, for here. Whenever somebody buys something from you, um, we could write a note to the contact record that says uh, this um, product was purchased on this date for this amount. So there's a lot of cool things that you can do. Uh, you can create history records, notes in ACT based on what people are doing on your storefront. Okay, the last one I wanna create now is gonna be for um, DocuSign. So some of you use DocuSign, you have to send contracts back and forth. We need to get signatures on these things. A lot of times you have to wait for your customers uh, you, uh, and you wanna know exactly when these things were signed. So we can create notes in ACT whenever uh, you send out a document to be signed or whenever a, a document is completed. Uh, so there's two different ways that we can uh, trigger that way. Uh, and uh, there's several different actions that we can create here. I'm going to create a very simple one just to show you how this works. I'm going to create a zap between uh, DocuSign and ACT. And so my trigger is going to be DocuSign. Here it is. Um, I'm going to create, I think, a history record so that I know exactly when uh, any of these DocuSign uh, documents have either been sent or signed and returned to me. So the event is going to be envelope sent or completed. Now, we can differentiate and separate these two later on. If you don't want uh, to trigger on both of these events, you can. I'll show you how you can set it up to uh, make it one or the other. So I'm going to click uh, yes, continue there. Now I have to sign into DocuSign, which I'm already connected to, but I have, I guess I have to sign in again. It may have logged me out because it's been a while. So I will log into DocuSign again here. They had a little bit of a connection issue earlier today, but it looks like it's working now. So that's good. So now when I click continue, we have this new trigger step where we have to choose what do we want to do. And by default, look, it says uh, it's going to trigger on both sent and completed envelopes if I don't choose anything. So here's where I could decide I only want to trigger on things that were sent or I only want to trigger on things that were completed. And these are two vastly different steps inside of DocuSign. So you may want to set up different uh, connections based on what's happening. Uh, but I'm going to leave them both selected. And uh, in the download form data area, I'm going to choose yes here because I want it to be able to kind of look on uh, the, doc the, the document and maybe pull data from there if, they, if it can read it. I'm going to click continue. And now I'm going to test this trigger. It's going to look inside my documents, inside DocuSign to see what activity has happened recently. Uh, if I go to DocuSign and I log in again, um, it will show me, I think, what I've done recently. I think I sent out a document uh, yesterday or earlier this morning. Uh, I think I also had one that I sent to myself and signed and sent back. So it should be able to find um, some recent activity here in my in my DocuSign account. Let's go back to uh, I guess starting now. Yeah, I have wait, one document waiting for others. So if I click on that, it shows me that here is a document that I sent to Robert Barker and I'm waiting for him to sign it. So this is this would be triggered under the send category for sure. So if I go back to um, Zapier, we can say it found two options for me. One has a status of completed. That means they have signed the document and sent it back to me. And then we have one for sent, which means I've sent it to them, but we're waiting for a signature. So that's what those two status um, values represent. We're going to use this most recent one for a document that was sent. 
and I'm going to click continue so that we can test this trigger and action. So in act, the action I want to create is I'm going to add a history record. We haven't done that yet. I could add a history. I could add a note to a contact record, but I really want to record this as history in act so that I know exactly when uh, these things took place. When did we send a document out? When did that? When did it get signed and returned to us? I want that to all show up as history records in ACT, so that I don't have to bounce back and forth between ACT and DocuSign if I need specific dates. Uh, so I'm going to click Continue, and it connects to my ACT account, of course. And so now the action is going to be the type of history I want to write. So um, let's see the type of history that I wanna write here is gonna be a letter sent. I think that's the type I can choose here. So you can see all the different types we have. Here's one called letter sent, that works for me. And for the contact, uh, I'm gonna do this uh, search step again because I wanna make sure I find this contact in ACT um, before, I, um, uh, before I can proceed. So we're going to find and create uh, the contact and act, and we're going to search by, again, like we've done before, email. There it is. And then the value to search by is going to be the email that comes from uh, the DocuSign uh, uh, recipient. Now it says, should this be a success if nothing is found? The answer is no. I don't want this to be a success if nothing is found. And I don't want to create an act contact because I'm under the assumption is if I'm already sending them contracts, they should already be contacts in my act database. So there should never be a need for me to create an act contact. Um, they should already be in my act database. So I'm just going to say, no, it's not a success if nothing is found. Um, so if, if there's no email found there, then something's gone wrong and I need to uh, reach out to them. Instead, I'm going to click continue. And now I'm just going to test this action to make sure that the search works. It's going to search for this contact in my ACT database. And there it is. A contact was found. Robert Barker. Here's all the data that it finds from, from ACT. So I know that's working. It can search in ACT for me and find contacts. Next, now is when we create the, the actual history item. So we have letter sent. That was We've already chosen that. The contact now is um, is what I can choose. It's going to be uh, the contact. It's going to be custom. And I'm going to look for the act contact. I want to work by their ID. So since they've already been created, I wanted to look up their actual contact record and put that in there. Now in the regarding field, what should it say in the regarding field of this history record? Uh, I've pre-typed this. It should say a DocuSign document with a status has been uh, created for the name of the contact. So I need to fill in these uh, placeholders with the actual fields uh, from both DocuSign and ACT. So the status is going to come from DocuSign. It's going to say, what is the status of uh, this document? And we know for this particular one, it's sent. So it's going to put that in there. It's going to say a DocuSign document with sent status. And it's going to be for the name of the contact. And I'm just going to put their full name in there. So inside ACT, I'm going to look up their full name. And that'll be what shows up in the regarding field. I could add things in the detail field too. Uh, for example, the status has changed. And here's where I'm going to put the status in there again. The status has been changed to sent. For a document in DocuSign for, and I'll put, Contacts name in here again. This is just adding additional um, details to make it look clean when these history records are created. You want to be able to make sure that anyone who happens upon this history record can make sense of it. So in the details, I want to make sure I, I say that there has been a status changed for a, a document that was sent to Robert. And I want to make a link to this signed or sent document, which we can find um, from within uh, DocuSign. So we can provide a link there, which will show up in the details area. And then start time. I don't wanna use this zap start time. I wanna actually use uh, the time that the signers uh, signed it or received it. So we're gonna look for 
a signer's date, uh, sent date. Here we go. And I'm just going to put that in both places because um, this is a history record that doesn't really need a different start and end time. So I'm going to put uh, that same uh, signer's uh, sent date and time in both places there so that we have a timestamp added uh, to whenever this took place. All right, so now I'm going to click continue. And I can test this action. Everything should come back perfectly. We should send a history record and act based on this document that was sent to one of my contacts inside DocuSign. If I go to act and I click on my history list, uh, we should see, here it is, a DocuSign document with sent status for Robert Barker. I'm going to double click that. And we can see this messy link that shows up. That's just the way that um, uh, DocuSign uh, makes these things linkable. So it gives me a letter sent uh, result type. It stamped the date and time when this document was sent. And so everything has come through as a good history record for me inside ACT. So in Zapier, I can publish this. And now I have uh, created an additional Zap between ACT and DocuSign. Okay, so wow, that was a lot of that was a lot of connections. You can see it's quite a whirlwind if you're trying to demonstrate seven different connections. But I wanted to show you how you can set these up so quickly. Um, and once you once you get comfortable with it, it's really get, it gets uh, repetitious and it's kind of like muscle memory. Uh, you can create these connections uh, super easily, and uh, wow, you're going to find that they're very useful for you going forward. Now, I just wanted to remind you that we have these live training webinars on the last Wednesday of every month. So uh, bookmark this page, act.com slash explore. That's where you can sign up for future webinars. And you can also view the previous webinars on demand. We're going to have 11 of them now. So you can go back and look at all the previous webinars that I've done, that Andy Wood has done uh, for all the different topics that you've suggested. And again, if you have additional topics you want us to suggest, shoot us an email at team at act.com. And we'll be happy to research that and um, give you more uh, training, more learning on the areas that you use or are confused with an ACT. Um, so that's what we'll do. So thank you very much for joining us. It looks like uh, Daniel has been handling the questions. Thank you so much, Daniel. Uh, this can be quite confusing, so I'm glad you've been here to answer those questions for us. Um, if you have any future questions, again, just email us uh, at team at act.com, and we'll answer those questions for you as well. So with that, I'm going to conclude this uh, training. Thank you for joining us this, this month. And we'll see you next month for another episode <laughs> of the Subscriber Training Webinars for ACT. Thank you and have a good day.